Hey, I welcome everyone to Unleash the Greatest Within. And my name is Tanya Anderson, host on this show. And today we have Chris Anderson. Welcome, my friend. Hi, Tanya. It's nice to finally meet you in person. And I think we've been following each other's passions and our work for a number of years. So it's great to participate and uphold what you're trying to do. That's a, it's a real privilege. It is a it is a blessing, my friend. So the topic we will talk about today, Chris and I, we will talk about wildlife conservation. Uh, there are better ways to complete our goals. I think I hope I say that word correctly, my friend. Yeah, I I think that um, I want to be cautious not to suggest that there, if there are better ways, that there are worse ways and. I think that um, there's some very unilateral ways that that we can work and attract a broader audience. And I think some of the history that I've seen over my career and over my adult life when I started paying attention to these issues was that there is a very uh, potentially divisive uh, approach to uh, conservation. And I think that there are some center grounds where we can meet people and have incredibly inspired and uh, well-educated outcomes. Mm, beautiful. And why did I pick Chris Anderson? Chris Anderson is a president of the Wolf Education and Research Center. I follow, as Chris said, him for many years, and I've never stopped to send him an email. And <laughs> in this year, I get finally the contact with him, and today he's here and sharing his wisdom to you. One thing I really feel so inspired by, by Chris's work is really he is serving other organizations to educate them and showing a, a way how we can work with Wolf and how we can educate mm -hmm. people around Wolf. And that is not often I see that with a Mason organization as Chris organizations is really helping other organizations. And I really love that value as serving others and because we are mm. fighting for the same purpose. So that is so inspired. And I really believe Chris is a leader for so many other organizations, how we can work together and serve each other. So I'm so pleased by Chris is here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, please, Chris, tell us a little bit about your amazing organization. Yeah, the, the organization that I run, um, it is an amazing organization. We were uh, one of the first organizations in the United States to work toward wolf conservation. Uh, a lot of people are familiar around the world with the Sawtooth Pack, Wolves of the Nez Perce. Um, they were not so familiar with the Owyhee Pack, which was named for the county of the uh, program that we took. Uh, we helped rescue 17 wolves from a uh, it, it wasn't really a breeding operation. It was more so somebody just got in over their head, they died, and then we worked with the U.S. Humane Society in uh, relocating those wolves. We took the five that we dubbed the Owyhee Pack. And um, so throughout our years, we saw um, a specific purpose. We were not interested in being a zoo. Um, our principal purpose was first and foremost to care for animals that that could not uh, be released into the wild. They would have perished for sure. They probably would have been killed by wolves, in, interestingly enough. Um, but once wolves are socialized, which is what happened in the film, uh, the films that were made, they were somewhat uh, uh, imprisoned to uh, being captive animals for the rest of their lives, which the upside to that is that over the last, well, since 1996, so for 26 years, we have hosted tens and tens of thousands of people at our sanctuary in Idaho. That sanctuary is no longer open uh, because we because we weren't in business to bring more wolves in. Um, we turned our attention to the future and the, the eventual future, hopefully, of opening another sanctuary, but also um, our, our research and our, uh, our, our efforts to educate the public in, in, in every venue possible. Mm, 
Beautiful. How did you find this purpose or passion for wolf as you have? Interesting question. I didn't have a passion for wolves. Um, I was a professional uh, working, <coughs> excuse me, working for an international humanitarian organization. And I inadvertently brought up uh, back in 2005, a person asked me, what did you do for Father's Day? And I said, oh, my kids took me to a wolf sanctuary. And she, <laughs> she, and she, she knew that I was leaving this job. Come to find out she was a board member. She recruited me on the spot. And uh, a couple months later, I was running the program and I've been running it for uh, since 2005. For, so for 17 years, Jeremy I and, and a handful of other people and interns have, have been doing this. Um, but it, it really did come down to, initially, I had no background in wolf biology. My background was in raptor biology, and I've spent uh, the same number of years as the Wolf Education Research Center is open. And if you see these posters behind me, I teach about raptors and birds of prey. And there are some really important uh, crossover anecdotes that uh, given the opportunity, maybe at the end when we do a little bit of freestyle and uh, I can share some of those anecdotes about what, how what we've learned in one area carries over to what we can learn and can teach in the others. Mm, beautiful. So what is three of the biggest challenges you're facing in your work to really find better ways to co complete our goals? Mm, yeah. Um, do I have to limit it to three? Because there's probably a hundred. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I was like, you also get one. I hope you hunt with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, no, this is a potentially a Pandora's box of a question. There are so so many threats to our work. I think that the the obvious answer to any nonprofit, especially one as modest as ours, the easy modest answer is, hey, we need money. Um, and uh, we we like to joke that Jeremy and I do about a million dollars worth of work on the on the budget of one uh, large uh, organization's uh, you know executive so we we do a lot of work and um, and money is a challenge always but <coughs> excuse me Tanya um, but there are some uh, other types of challenges and I think that my my journey probably best represents what those challenges are because previous to 2005, I had no comprehension of this issue, why it was an issue, uh, why wolves were threatened. And once that subject was uh, revealed to me, I kind of was faced with the question, OK, what am I going to do about this? Mm. And um, so the it, it isn't uh, there's a lot of people that want to want to blame humanity and i'm just not that guy i think i prefer to look at the side that hey we're capable of greatness we're capable of doing mm -hmm. amazing things do we make mistakes do we uh slip up along the way and choose the wrong choices yeah absolutely but um once you're informed then you have no excuse there there literally is two roads i'm going to do something about it or I'm going to ignore it. And mm -hmm. our job, our, our job is to help people understand in a way where they see the that binary outcome and and present them. But it comes back to uh, you know, so so that second threat is public indifference. Our our task is to overcome that indifference and educate mm. the public. And then and then if I had to uh say a, a third i think it's just um i've been doing this for 17 years and i always feel like i'm running out of time um and not not that i'm getting old or well i probably am uh but but jeremy and i man we have aged and and i mentioned jeremy jeremy heft is the uh wildlife biologist and sanctuary consultant on our team Mm. And uh, and you'll you're going to be interviewing him as well. You'll love that interview. But but he and I are not getting younger. And 
knowing that we have paved the way or created something that the next generation can take up this mantle is extremely important because all the rules have changed, reaching younger people, inspiring them to approach it from the ethos that we think it should be approached from. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we I don't want to see this banner that I've been flying for 17 years crumple into the landscape. That is beautiful. I really like the second one you're saying. What is coming to me as we also talk about is like meet people where they are. I have been in my past been vivid judgment and it's all about myself. When we judge, it's only about ourselves. I really like this when you we get to choose to meet people where they are to really connect with them. And from there, we really can find better ways together and find new ways, new solutions, how we can work together and make an impact in wildlife uh, conservation. So I really like that, like empathy to meet people where they are instead of be judgment like it is the humankind that is the, the issue yeah. in this world. So I really like that because I really believe no one do not like have this like finger. I do not like that when someone like <laughs> telling me how to do is like, no, nope, yeah. you are not seeing me right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We we try not to do a lot of finger wagging uh, be, because it, it's really not helpful. Um, and um, but I but I am reminded of a, a situation very early in my career. I had an experience that really has been a, a compass for me. And I was looking for owl pellets that I could use in in uh, our labs our science labs, because we we also create science labs for schools. And um, I wanted I wanted to talk to this farmer and it, there's a barn owl over behind me, over my right shoulder. And I, we may be backwards, but you can read it on the board. It's on my, my yeah, it's over my right shoulder. Oh, I like that story. Um, <laughs> you're, you're okay. coming with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the it, we we went to uh, this farm and and I knocked on the door and I I approached this farmer and I said, hey, I, I think that there's barn owls living in a silo. And if you don't know what a silo is, it's a tall uh, uh, kind of elevated uh, tube that is used to store hay or grain or silage. And um, and he said, interesting story there's a barn owl in there that's been in there for 25 years. Well, I was faced with a choice. I, I could correct him or I could let him think what he thinks and knowing and trusting a, a, an ongoing relationship with him, I could slowly bring him into a proper understanding that a barn owl's average lifespan is three to five years. He actually was looking at potentially the fifth or sixth generation of of owls in that mm. silo and now thankfully i chose the right way to do it and it has been instructive for my entire approach i i gave him our literature uh, we have a very comprehensive guide and to teaching about barn owls and uh, as i presented him that information two or three visits later this farmer when I went back again, uh, he actually self-corrected. And I thought that that lesson is so important. The, the, we have to respect people enough to not be the end all of all knowledge, overwhelm them with information. They can, most of us can only take small doses mm. of truth or, or facts. And we have to be able to digest and, and now add into that someone like me who is a visual learner uh th then i have to read it five times but if i look at it and see it i, I learn it on the first time so i think just being mindful tanya that that even though we are experts in our field the world isn't really looking for experts they're looking for relationship exactly. and that's that's an essential theme in in my work Mm. and it is so beautiful like also down to earth to really creating relationships instead of like 
this old frame around, I get to educate you. It's all about relationship. On this point, when you going after to create a relationship, other people feel uh, they are being seen, they are heard, and we are connecting. On that point, there is so much more learning and expanding and opportunity for them to really step in to really make the small change so they can really save uh, wildlife conservation, like be a part of it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I I think that, you know, I, I just, I don't really care to meet, and I don't know if this is just a sign of getting older, but I mean, I don't even really, I won't buy another TV because I don't even want to learn a new remote control. So it's just like you, you come to a place where you're just really self-honest about you know, I, I'm really worn out by all the experts in my life. And I have to believe that the the public feels the same way. We have too many people who are, uh, and, and the science would suggest, and this has been studied and, and, uh, uh, and studied, you know, for decades, the science is often wrong. I mean, the, the number of times that the science gets something wrong uh, is startling and it at the very least it shouldn't want make you want to throw out the scientific community's understanding or conclusion but it should make you be a cognitive thinker in that okay it, if this science is true then um then you know how, how do i build on that instead of what we do a lot which is we we kind of pick at it and kind of tear away at, at truth Mm -hmm. uh and 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 disproving something is not bad uh science i mean disproving something has led more people to truth than than a lot of uh you know i think it's more productive actually than just blindly accepting scientific facts uh disproving it will lead you to either an acceptance or the evidence that of something different mm -hmm. exactly Going a little bit back around how these three threats uh, you are facing in your work is one mm -hmm. of those one of the powerful things mm -hmm. is I uh, really meet the people where they are and give them opportunity to step into their own learning as you share with the the story that is so beautiful. So how do you else turn your threat around to something powerful? Well, I I think that the the answer is an extremely impractical answer. Um, the The best thing that we can do, um, both individually and professionally, is to be the right example, and that in itself is a is a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. But but I I think that you know if we if we fall back on the basis of you know we're trying to form relationships with people or communities or civic groups, then uh, we, we have to truly lead. And, and I, I'm one who, the leaders who um, are demonstrating behavior that, that resonates with me are people that I wanna follow. I don't wanna follow that person who's sitting in an office back in the state or, or federal capital and, and has never started a business or never uh, stepped foot into wilderness to see why it's worth protecting or anything in between. Mm, mm, beautiful. So what specific tool has been the solution to your success process in your work? Well, the, the tool that we employ the most is determination. I mean, we are uh, vigilantly unrelenting. Um, we, we don't ever stop. It's been 17 years of nonstop sacrificial. We've gone without pay. Uh, we've found other ways of paying the bills. We, we um, you know, it, we haven't sold our children or anything yet, but, you know, the grandchildren are, if they're at risk. Um, no, I, I think that you know, we live in an amazing age where, uh, if I was to think practically about the tools, um, social media and uh, the digital age is phenomenal. Um, I, I built a business that 
we started, we were pioneers in the in building websites and getting on the internet and selling a product. Um, and we still sell that product today to 7,000 teachers across the United States. Um, but on the Wolf Center side, it's less of an, it's a less tangible product. Um, but just leveraging the, the uh, digital uh, age, you know, but there's a really a cautionary tale in that we can't forget about the analog uh, uh, contacts and relationships because a lot of people, especially, you know, even, I mean, there's a growing, uh, there was a study I read a couple of weeks ago, how there's a growing audience of younger people who are rejecting digital media, re rejecting this constant connectivity that we have. Mm. And, um, but I think that careful balance of being aggressively a student of, of social media, a student of, of blogging and podcasting and, and, e and a, even what you're doing right here, I'm learning from this. And I've said it time and time again, it's really relevant that if you're not continually a student of everything around you, then you're part of the problem. You, we, we have enough expert. We need more students, exactly. and um, so <clears throat> maybe somebody in your audience or our audience will hear this and they'll say, "Hey, we can, we can help you with your social media." Or, uh, and we have, uh, we've got a team of great writers and uh, and graphic designers, and and but it all comes at a cost. And I think that, you know. Uh, nothing is free. And, and uh, so to do this work, it, the greatest tool is just determination. We're going to get it done. We're not, we're, we're not going to give up. I really like this with also what you have talking into is like never give up. Like I have, I don't know how many years I have going for to send your email, different kind of emails in my state of yeah. my life. What I've been yeah. through it's like also to you, dear audience, like never give up on something you really feel so called to in your whole being. Also, if it's foggy, also when it's not feel like it, go after it and play with it. Just do it yeah. and also be a student because we get to really take the actions because the animals, wildlife conservation cannot wait on us to figure things out and maybe right, one day right. 10 years of your life has gone because you are <clears throat> holding you back in fear or you're afraid of to be uncomfortable or you're afraid of stuff you need to go out of it as Chris also talked about like one of the tools is really never give up and be around people that can be a great mentor like Chris Anderson is yeah. he's a great mentor for you to really connect mm. to one of the very important value value as we a human can is connecting as a team and serve each other in our work as Chris is and that is one of the many things I really love with Chris work and I really mm. believe that is one of the the tools we get to get in and really support each other because we are fighting for the same purpose why not to connect and serve each mm -hmm. other in our with our skills like <laughs> Yeah, that's my that's my dog uh, in the background. <laughs> Sorry about that. He was just oh, agreeing with everything you said. He's like, he's yeah. like yes, amen. <laughs> <laughs> now oh, somebody came to the door, I I think, but uh, any anyhow, uh, Tanya, your your words are very kind and. Um, you know, most of us who do this work, we're not out there uh, w winning any awards. You know, you you do it because you do, you are passionate about it. Uh, there are a couple things that I'm very mindful of. Um, I I think we talked about this previously, but when you travel to the state of California, um, the the mascot on the state flag is a grizzly bear. Now, at one point, uh, about a hundred. And some years ago, from Alaska to Mexico, the grizzly bear ranged. There were several different species, uh, but the grizzly bear had an entire West Coast range, and um, including California. So prolific were the bears in California that they put it on their flag. Now, Oregon has beavers, and be beavers are the you know, the mascot for that state. And uh, 
uh, Washington has some George Washington. So, um, but what's tragic to me is that there are no wild um, grizzlies in the state of California today. And so if we don't mm -hmm. think it's possible that a species could be made extinct, uh, and, and this is our concern with wolves, it was our concern with with eagles, which is our national symbol. Uh, and, and, you know, there, there's been many successful campaigns. The Endangered Species Act of 1973 was a leading uh, uh, regulation that was created in the United States. It, it was absolutely visionary in, in becoming a tool that the world would adopt. And um, so I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that I think the right humans at the right time chose these right things. But we're at that intersection right now. And there are animals that are under threat of uh, from a variety of reasons. I mean, you have you have uh, one camp talks mostly about climate change, and that's a very real uh, consideration. Um, but a lot of the species that are under threat are just under threat from human lifestyle and um, much, much similar to the to the same uh, point of like in the 1800s, we were killing thousands and thousands of, of geese in the United States to send the plumage and the feathers off to European hat makers. And and at some point there was they they ran into a problem with the geese population, um, but it's symbolic of um, the larger problem in the we have technology that's remarkable today. We don't we don't need to have a goose filled coat, um, uh, and and not at the expense of um, of potentially imbalancing nature and and quite frankly imbalancing our humanity mm, mm. that's so powerful you're talking a little bit like around lifestyles uh, because i really believe it is our lifestyles that is making um the challenge we have in the world and as i see it like if i of course is some people is aware about it some people is not aware about it and that's why it's so pe so important to meet people where they are because we never know where they are in the like in state of mind or like mm -hmm. how much awareness they have so on that point like what can people do in their lifestyle like what can i do in denmark that will support your work uh, because mm -hmm, you're a long mm -hmm. way for me so like what can i do in my lifestyle that will serve your work well um Tanya, what you personally are doing is uh, remarkable. Uh, you you yourself are already there. Um, there are other charismatic, dynamic uh, people who are good at building relationships who could who could learn from you and follow in your footsteps. And and were you to have the ability or the uh, the the connections to mentor younger people coming up, or even they don't have to be younger. I mean, anybody who has an interest, but but being honest about their limitations, obviously, mm -hmm. you, you're you obviously very determined. And uh, it, it, uh, it it's, it's inspiring in itself. And uh, there are things to learn. But I think what I, as far as lifestyles, I mean, if you just the human nature is just what it is. And we all think that we are going to do more. Um, and, and most of us know that we should do more a lot like a gym membership, right? <laughs> um, the, <laughs> but, but the, the reality is, it is we, true. Live in it's that true. Yeah. We, we live in that middle place where we once we get ourselves home at night from our work or anything we we kind of fall into patterns that are really unproductive and they're not very self-fulfilling yeah. potentially not everybody i mean there there's a percentage of people who are are my heroes so, you know they they don't fall into that mm. um but instead of binge watching game of thrones 
what about binge watching the animal planet you know or some nature documentaries how about learning about the world around you good grief kids don't even know today where milk comes from in inner in inner cities mm. uh our kids in, in urban environments they don't understand that it's cotton that has made the fabric for the clothes they're wearing or any number of other examples and i think that's where we that's the space where we live is uh, and and if you look again at that barnell poster and this is kind of a theme in my work that one barnell is holding a a football <clears throat> and most people are like what the heck you know the that why is that a football but our our uh, i use that in a teaching uh, setting to demonstrate that hey this is how much most kids know how much a football or a soccer ball weighs yeah. so if so if we use a football a child will never forget that that's the weight of a barn owl so we put it in the the owls the clutches of its talons and and but trying to you know uh make learning you know be honest about how we learn and go out and find find that avenue that is going to increase your understanding. The other lifestyle that I think, uh, and I know I'm going long on this answer, the other lifestyle is be gracious with people. We, we, we don't know everything and um, there's nothing more off-putting to me when I receive it or when I give it when I act like people should know what I know. Um, <clears throat> and I don't, I just don't like how it feels on either end. At the time, I don't think much about it, but looking back on an incidence where I've behaved that way, mm. I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, that, that was a real fail on my part. So I think that even in this environment of trying to save wildlife, I think we have to uh, be gracious with people and, and understanding that we all, there are reasons that we behave the the way we do, and I will do a plug for a really influential book uh, that that um, I I recently read. I've read it a couple times, and I read it with one of our kids. Um, it's called The Outward Mindset by the Arbinger Institute, and the premise of the book is: Hey, people behave the way they behave for a reason, and do you want to live? in greater understanding of why people behave the way they do. And another good influence is Simon Sinek. And he asks, you know, he challenges the public to operate from the position why. The how is easy. It's the why yeah. that that leads to change. And those are some of the, the those are just some of the, <clears throat> the wisdom that I've been blessed with. And maybe that will help somebody today. Mm, I love Simon. He's amazing how he really getting in and the details. One other thing I really like is really it's so important to explore the world and going out there like visit your organization, visit other organizations so we can really feel it in our whole being instead of seeing it because when we in it, it will like mm. getting a bigger impact on us and we really make the actions in our work whatever business mm -hmm. we are in to be an animal advocate um so the last thing chris what when people go to your newsletter sign up to that what what is the benefit for, for them to sign up well um we we certainly don't want to betray everything that i've just said and shared with you um we're our our newsletter is unique in that it's not a fundraising newsletter uh and it, it, we produce hundreds and hundreds of articles on various subjects of canines, carnivores, and conservation. Our print newsletter is actually titled that. It's called C3, Canines, Carnivores, and Conservation. But within the our blog on our website or the email newsletter, uh, we, we do what we call deep dives uh, with uh, birds of prey. And, and I write about different birds of prey and their biology and ecology. Um, but also uh, we have a fun series called 
misunderstood meso carnivores, misunderstood mesos, then Jeremy hopefully will talk a little bit about that as he writes those articles. And it's just all about connecting people to uh, either uh, uh, wildlife that is uh, near us uh, to wildlife that they may not experience and then filling in some of the gaps about how many species of foxes are there? Uh, how many species of skunks are there? What is a skunk? Well, skunk is a mesocarnivore. Did you know that word before I said it? And it, it, these are fun topics to share with the public. We do this with vigilance. We produce three of those articles per week. And, uh, but I'll be honest, if somebody is touched by what we're doing and wants to click on that donate button, we're not offended. <laughs> <laughs> And to you, my dear audience, all the links to Chris's work and what he'll talk about is in your email and down below this video. So please go and sign up to the newsletter and explore in this world what Chris has shared and really learn how can you connect with others where they are. Because what Chris is stand for, he also gives you in the newsletter. And that is one of the really fundamental things we get to learn is really learn first of all to connect with ourselves where we are and to others where they are. And there's also a lot of other details and information in your newsletter around Chris' work. So please, please, I will inspire you and motivate you to do that because when we have learned some new information, it's so important to act on it. Because when we choose to say, I will wait, I will do it later, we are losing so much insight knowledge. We are losing the motivation we get to really act on to be an animal advocate or be a part of Chris' work. So please use mm -hmm. a half an hour on this. A half hour will make a big change in your personal life mm -hmm. and also in wildlife conservation work. So really use a half hour of this. If you need to move, please see this into you again and make the half an hour work afterwards. So you will in it and make the actions with clear mind. So Chris, thank you so much again for being here on this show and saying yes and it was a big blessing for you to share your wisdom with us it's my it's my privilege tanya and and again thank you for what you're doing um we uh th these are important partnerships and you're a great example so thank you thank you so much my friends thank you so much and thank you so much the audience for watching this and uh, we wish you an amazing day and see you soon again my friends. Bye, everyone.